Hey, what's up? And thanks for uh, listening in for another question and answer session. If you have a question, you can swing over to the afterburnpodcast.com or click the link in the show notes below or wherever you're listening. Check out the show notes again, the afterburnpodcast.com and you can go and submit your question there. If you're willing to support the podcast, you can swing over to the show homepage or over to the Patreon, which is patreon.com backslash the afterburn podcast. You can find that link on the afterburnpodcast.com if that's not confusing enough. But again, all the support is helping the podcast grow and Patreon supporters, you guys jump to the front of the line for all the Q and A's. Today, I got my good friend Knuckles joining me. He is a former Air Force F-16 flight surgeon and he is going to help answer some questions about go pills. Okay. Awesome. Hey, Knuckles, thanks for joining me. Your expertise is much needed here because... <laughs> As the end user of this, or in the past having used this, I don't know much about it other than it's highly regulated. And as a flight surgeon, you guys would prescribe us dextrogen, or how do you say it? Yeah, so yeah, dex or dextroamphetamine is like the generic uh, version of it. Yeah, I would just call it dex or go pills. So there you go. Yeah, it's like the simple like pilot. I I don't understand things. Like I need a crayon to just like scribble stuff. But got a question says, I was listening to Dan Rooney's book, Fly Into the Wind, and learned that fighter pilots can legally use or be subscribed dextrogen when needed. When do you... So, I'll let you kind of lead in probably the, the side effects. Yeah, so it's... Uh, the medication itself is similar to like what you would use to treat like ADHD, so attention deficit disorder, and it just helps with the focus and concentrations, as well as the alertness. So, that's kind of the, the reason it's used. And as far as when it's used, so it's primarily used only in combat zones. So when guys are flying and there's a question mark as to how long the length of that flight might be, obviously in the, the fighter community, majority of the airframes are single seaters. And so with that, you know, if you're by yourself, it can be a very quiet and very lonely uh, experience up there. I'm sure you can kind of attest to that. If it's a quiet day, it can be used for um, like special situations. So in theater, the aspect of it is, is that, you know, when I was there, we sent every pilot, they took off and they had at least two of uh, the 10 milligram dextrin. Uh, amphetamine on board uh, with them in case they needed it. It's a scout honor type uh, use system. So you use what you feel you need if you feel you need it uh, for whatever reason or if things are getting chaotic and crazy and you feel like you're struggling or you're, you're getting fatigued. It's the at the pilot's discretion to use the medication. We give uh, significant amounts of lectures and discussion to the pilots regarding the medication as far as when to use it, other things that can be done instead of just using that medication. Um, some guys, I think, think it's a catch-all or, well, I didn't <laughs> sleep great. Um, I'm just going to take the medication. I'll be alert and awake. But, you know, it's kind of the, the second or third line behind proper sleep management, proper hygiene and exercise um, for guys to, to kind of use to help them with focus and counteract fatigue when they're flying these long missions at night uh, in, in the combat zones. Um, there are a couple of exercises that are out there that have significantly long durations of flight that it has been approved. That's not typically the case, though. It's one of those where that requires like MAGCOM commander approval uh, before that'll get approval down to the wing itself. So uh, you have to have a, a legitimate and a solid reason to, to warrant getting that if you're going to go do like an exercise rather than going to combat. Because it is tied to a controlled substance. Is it similar to, I mean, is it in the family like methamphetamines or like what, what is the, th yeah, the threat it's, there? It, is it, it is very an, addictive? It, yeah, so it is an amphetamine in that setting. So it does have a high, it's highly addictive. And that's the biggest issue with it. Um, so if you recall, like from deployment, when you came back, there's a questionnaire that we go through as flight docs and we look how many tablets of dextroamphetamine you took. So when you come down and land, uh, the pilots are supposed to log how much they use and how much they have remaining because we uh, don't like our pilots having excess amounts of dextroamphetamine uh, for the, uh, the the crazy yeah. thoughts that sometimes run in minds. Um, fun, fun, fun sponges. Those yeah. doctors. <laughs> so uh, we, we look through that log to see how much was used. And then at the end of the deployment, we go through it and see how much did you use in the duration of the whole deployment. And it kind of ties in there. They asked too, does this ever go wrong? So have you heard any horror stories where guys are getting addicted to this or have some kind of adverse reaction? Uh, I've not heard of anybody having like an adverse reaction. I have heard of guys uh, basically like living. They, this is all they want. This is all they can get. The only other side of it that can be kind of nasty for the flight doc side is if you lose count, you don't have uh, proper documentation supporting 
how much was given, who had what to support all that, then that can lead into going through possibly losing your medical license, having repercussions from no kidding. Uh, the wing and things along those lines. Because it is a controlled substance, so uh, you being the prescriber are kind of given the trust and the final, uh, hey, this is your responsibility to monitor and keep an eye on. And if you lose control of it, then you you may lose your ability to continue to practice uh, what you've been trained for. Which is one thing too, I don't think people realize, like I remember, you know, the deployments, flight docs always have their little pill box. And that is definitely something too, you have to factor in. Like, it's not like you're just going to Walgreens and picking up your prescription. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's one of those, like, uh, like you said, usually uh, in the deployed zone, it's under lock and key. So these medications are not just available the hospitals, wherever you're at, whether it's a base or at your home station, if they're prescribed out to you or your squadron, uh, they do a monthly reconciliation where they validate how much do you have and then they go through your charting um, as part of that upkeep to make sure that you're not just saying that you only have 20 left and there's no documentation of where it went. I know uh, just a really big deal. I think my commander on our deployment, he had seen in the early days of Gulf War Two or whatever we want to call it, you know, 2003 time frame guys get addicted to it in his squadron so he was really adamant and i would say not protective but he drove the point home like you have to respect the stuff and you know, document it and make sure you don't go down the rabbit trail that you don't want to go to and yeah. the last part of this question is are there things pilots use before reaching go pills like red bull and caffeine pills and i know that's something you guys definitely encourage yeah so we, we try to honestly steer clear of any like the uh, stimulant type energy drinks and it's uh, it's not necessarily because it doesn't do what it's kind of supposed to do. Um, the biggest issue with it is, is just there's, uh, there's very little, uh, medical research related to those substances. They're not FDA approved. Um, so it's one of those things where from our perspective, you're putting a substance in, you don't know what that impact's going to be on your kidneys. You don't know what that impact's going to be on your liver. Um, and there are guys who have had issues where you know they've had acute kidney failure because they've just been drinking energy drinks or uh, they'll give themselves palpitations and end up in an emergency room to figure out why their heart won't stop racing. Um, and they realize or state that they drank you know five or six monsters in the course of 24 hours and there and lies your answer. Things before that that we always do, kind of like I alluded to, is uh, sleep mitigation. So we always try to make sure that if you're going to be transitioning from days to night, we want you to have 72 hours of kind of a free time zone um, that allows you to, to slowly transition. Um, you know, your first lines are your sleep, your hygiene, exercise, diet, all those things kind of play into it. And then, you know, once you've achieved or used all of those other kind of formalities to help with mitigation, then you go into kind of the pharmacological side of things where you could use medications to help. So yeah. But it's definitely a necessary thing. I know, you know, our deployment, the rooms or the walls are paper thin. I was a night guy. So I'm sleeping during the day when everyone else is up making noise. It seemed like there was a forklift that was always running in reverse, just like perfect. Just like, I don't know where they're moving stuff, but it was always in reverse. Um, so you came not dependent, right? That's the wrong word to use, but you needed no goes and then subsequently go pills. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I use go pills on occasion. I remember there's one sorting in particular, like over Northeast Syria, our crypto, there's an issue with that. So we couldn't talk to the guys in the ground. So it was just four hours of static radio noise. And I took it into the sortie because I was like, I am not going to make it back home. Like I'm going to fall asleep in the jet because there's just nothing going on. So yeah, uh, and that's, I know we had a couple of guys where the situation was they were at the end of the, the flight getting ready to land and weather was terrible in Bagram. And so they, you know, each tried like two or three approaches because they really didn't want to go somewhere else and, you know, ended up having to divert down to Kandahar. And so, you know, adds an extra hour, hour and a half into your flight that you weren't planning on. And having those medications help those guys quite a bit. The Air Force and the military does not want to lose either one. Uh, obviously, the person is more important than the plane. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't give you an ejection seat. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. So uh, it's one of those things where, you know, they're protective and they would want to make sure that as safe as you can be, but aware that there are situations where these medications are needed. And uh, I think there are numerous pilots who would say that similar to your kind of what you're, you're stating is that, you know, there are probably been numerous pilots that have been in situations where if they didn't have a, a, a go pill on them, that they could take and get a little bit of that focus and concentration and uh, stimulant effect out of, they may not have made it back to where they're supposed to go that day. Yeah, no joke. Well, Knuckles, thanks for joining me and you know giving the expert 
well, not opinion, but giving some expertise to this topic because again, I'm just a dumb fighter pilot and it'd just be like, go pills. Yay. They keep me awake and no goes, put me to sleep. So thanks for answering that, man. And I appreciate you taking the time and look forward to chatting uh, with you soon. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Ryan. Awesome. Knuckles did a much better job than I could have possibly done talking about go pills. Jumping into a few more questions. Jordan, here's Jordan's question. With being always very passionate about what I'm involved in, I find it hard not to take criticism personally with compartmentalizing the, and compartmentalizing the feedback. With the setting up or with setting up for promotion to tech sergeant, which is an Air Force uh, rank there and listed structure, and finishing my degree and getting ready to sell my motorcycle to put towards flight hours to build my package for the end of the year. So the package referring there is uh, for officer training school. Obviously critical for current career as well as future goals in the military. How did you manage to handle that pill and being able to avoid kicking yourself over things you missed or made a mistake or missing personal or professional goals or marks? All right. So not an easy thing, right? We all want to be right and we all want to win. That's, I think, human nature. There's probably someone out there who doesn't care about that. But I think, again, the most most people want to win. Most people want to be liked. So when you fall short of that, how do you deal with that? How do I deal with that? Like one, it sucks, period, right? Like everyone wants to win. Everyone wants people to like them. Like them. Um, that, that's just human nature. So there's really no way getting around that other than, you know, the way I do it is, you just got to tell yourself, one, you're not the first and you won't be the last, right? When it comes to missing a mark or that. So anytime I mess something up, right? Take note of what you messed up or how much you missed your goal by. And then you got to peel back the onion as far as what do you need to do in order to fill that gap in order to make it better the next time. One big thing that I think is very valuable is setting goals. Part of that is setting goals that are obtainable, realistic and attainable. So if I said, I want to be an astronaut, that's not realistic. I'm not smart enough to be an astronaut. But if you do meet the criteria or potentially meet the criteria, setting those type goals, I think is important, right? It's something you have to reach for, but it's something that you can potentially grasp and hold on to. I could not hold on to being an astronaut. Again, I'm not just, I'm not that smart. So setting those goals that are attainable and realistic is the very first step. And so when you're looking at missing marks or missing goals, I think answering that question, was this an obtainable or was this a realistic goal is definitely a good thing when you go into debrief yourself. If it was, now comes the part of, hey, let's peel back the onion. Why did I miss my goal? And that depends, right? There could be a whole slew of reasons depending on what you're talking about. And I think it's very important to do that self-reflection, dig, get that feedback from other people. One of the toughest things I find is giving negative feedback. Some people do it very easily. Along with those lines, receiving negative feedback feedback also sucks. But it's one of those things as I've done more and more in my life, I rather hear the bad news or that negative feedback from those around me versus it going behind my back and not getting better. Like I want to know that news, so I seek that. What could I do better? What are your recommendations? I also watch and learn and just try to be a sponge from those around me. And as I kind of work, I think working back to front here for your question, so to speak, and that that first part you kind of asked was, how do you manage and handle the pill and being able to avoid kicking yourself over and over again? And this is one of those things that everyone is going to fail. There are a lot of great quotes and a lot of great books out there on failure and learning from failure. With that, you have to realize, again, as I said at the very beginning, is there are those that have and those that will. And what I mean by that is there are those that have messed up and there are those that will mess up. Everyone will do it at some point. The severity and the degree they mess up will vary, but know that you're not alone. If we're talking Air Force pilot training, right? Everyone has hooked a ride. There are those that have and those that will. So know that that is part of it and that is part of the learning and growing process. And you just have, you have to accept that. It's how you deal with that failure. What lessons you take from that failure? How do you grow to be better? All right. Last question for this week is about pilot training. It says, I just got accepted. Uh, I just received a pilot training slot. So congratulations first off. And I'm wondering if you have any tips or advice for succeeding at pilot training. The first phase is about six weeks, which is all academics. The part I care about and the part I'm going to talk about is phase two, 
which is the first phase of flying in pilot training. It's about six months long and everyone goes to the T6. I'll put a big asterisk here because the Air Force is going through so many changes with pilot training and we're calling it UPT, which is undergraduate pilot training 2.5. And we're doing these evolutions and trying to streamline and create efficiencies and integrate AI and all sorts of stuff. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother topic in itself, but inherently everyone's going to show up. They're going to go through roughly the same program. It's like drinking from a fire hose, usually with information. At least that's how it used to be back in the day when it was tough. But there are definitely some tips and tricks to succeeding, in my opinion. And it's pretty simple. And I think you can apply it across every discipline. And I get people asking this all the all the time. While I am no expert, I think it's very simple. And, and Rain's humble opinion is just be a good dude or good do- dudette. That's the first step. If you're a good person, you're willing, which means you're willing to work hard, you're willing to look out for others, you have a good attitude, and you're building and proving the capability and skill set that they're there to train you to do, being that good dude and good dudette. It's multifaceted. I always looked as an, for an instructor for those in the group that were one, either out for themselves and didn't look out for anyone else, or two, the group that not only looked out for their own progression, but they did it in a manner that brought other people up. So if they got a bit of information, if they messed something up on a ride, they weren't the ones that played I Have a Secret. They took that lesson learned and they shared it. Sharing it and helping others out. Because that's going to do two things. One, that's going to make you a better person because it's going to reinforce that lesson that you learned. And it's making you a teacher an instructor, the next level where you want to be, right? And then two, it's going to bring that person up as well. And if we're talking specifically about flying jets and flying in the Air Force, what is the fighting force? The men fighting force is typically two two jets, right? You always have a wingman. So if you start pilot training out, looking out for just numero uno, you will not do well. The flying ability, everything that goes into it, that stuff will separate itself out. You're going to show up and they're going to be people that have natural ability. They're going to be people who show up and they have thousands and thousands of flight hours and they're going to do better or they're going to do worse. You just don't know because there's an Air Force way of flying and then there's everyone else's way of flying. But the main thing is you have that good attitude. You embrace, you be that sponge with your mouth shut, absorb the lesson and the information that's being provided to you and implement that into everyday life and you'll win. Simple, right? But again, I think the biggest thing is be that good person, look out for others, bring others up. You're joining an organization where you're there to fight as a team. And if you can't figure that out on day one, then you're not going to do well. You might get by, you might have that natural skill set and that gift, but at some point it's going to catch up to you. I guarantee it. Awesome. Well, thanks for listening. That's a quick Q&A. Looking to do these every two weeks. If you have a question, again, swing over to the afterburnpodcast.com. You can submit your questions there. And if you're looking to support the show, swing over to patreon.com backslash the afterburn podcast. All the help is appreciated. Until next time.